Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we're back with season two, question mark, of Trapped Under Blasteric. I don't know. Yeah, but we shouldn't call it season two. It's yeah, we, t- it's still season, season one. Still. We haven't we, we haven't decided. Yeah, we, we were going to not shoot this episode, and we we're just going to talk uh, changes we want to see in season two of the podcast, and then we realized that someone gave us money to advertise their product on this yeah. day, so we needed to do this episode. Speaking of which, I think I have one of their minis in my drawer over there that I have mostly built. So okay. I'll, yeah. I'll bring that out. Very nice. Uh, to, to look at. Um, yeah, but we're still going to do that, right? We're still going to have a meeting of the minds over the attendees. Yes. To so, yeah. really dig in. Yeah, let's discuss that. So there were so many gigantic comments on on Patreon, in our DMs, in uh, the comment section of the last podcast episode mm-hmm. with so much good feedback and stuff to read through. And we want to give ourselves a lot of time to read through that and discuss what we like about each point that's being made. Yeah, because I think there there are a lot of really useful bits of info that we've read through already. Yes. And we said, hey... We should take some like adulting time <laughs> to really digest, create a working document of all this stuff. This is all boring things <laughs> they don't want to hear about. But yeah, we'll probably skip an episode at some point in the future and then officially christen the first episode of season two. What are you doing? John is, he's drinking out of a soda can and he's taking his pointer finger and he's touching the mouthpiece and then licking his finger. Are you an animal? Because it, it's really sharp and I cut myself and I... Lick the blood. Okay, freak. All right, anyways, uh, first thing in the preamble is uh, Daniel Trainer, who was a commenter on the last uh, podcast, prefers the tagline, the podcast for the miniature hobby enthusiast. Daniel, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and, the, and the bare minimum work that we put into creating a script for each podcast episode, there's one thing Scott's got to make sure he has. I screenshotted the caption <laughs> and I linked it to this comment so you could open it. Yeah, oh, I saw it. You know, did you read it? Did you see that? It's a real comment. <laughs> you posted it on your imager yeah. just so I could look at it. Thank you, Daniel. Your comments mean a lot. Everyone else's don't. Just Daniel's. <laughs> <laughs> miniature hobby enthusiast maybe it's not so much the term it's just the person that's saying it that yikes <laughs> wow uh, anyways i appreciated it um i was assembling some sisters of battle recently for a, a video that we'll talk about later um and i'm also kind of messing around in my head with the idea of a sob kill team Mm. And so I was like, kind of just like looking at the sprue and, and looking at stuff. And I was like, I found, I saw a crossbow in there. What? And I was like, what the heck is this thing? And it's a crossbow that goes on top of a bolt pistol. And I'm like, this is so freaking cool. <laughs> and so I started just looking through this kit. In this box, which comes with 10 Battle Sisters, I think costs $50. Okay. Which is a lot of money, right? It's a lot of money. But it makes Battle Sisters, Dominions, and Celestials, which are three different units-ish. Basically, the difference is that one can take more special weapons and more heavy weapons. Okay. But there are so many extra bits in that box that for a moment, Mm. I forgot it cost $50. Oh. And then I remembered and I was like still angry, but I was so, I was so happy with the amount of bits that I would harvest from this thing after assembling just 10 normal sisters. It was, it was pretty good. Could you, could you use those crossbows? In something for a fantasy setting too? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I just think of like the Diablo three demon hunter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dual wheel and hand crossbows. Yeah, for sure. It'd be a great conversion. I think there are some dark elf models that have repeater hand crossbows, aren't there? Uh I thought that there was I thought there was a dark Eldar that had that from forty K, but crossbows? Hand crossbows. Okay. I know for a fact do you know what dogs of war are? Mm-mm. Dogs of War were this like weird faction in fantasy that you could basically hire into your army. Oh, sure. So like units like vampire counts could get cannons, whereas otherwise they wouldn't be able to get cannons. But there was a there was a unit in the Dogs of War army called Mengil's Manflaters, and it was a unit of dark elves. And I know they every single one one of them they at least had one repeater hand crossbow and then like a sword. There might be ones with dual wielding ones as well. But I gotta imagine like corsairs don't have something like that. Yes, they do. I was thinking of. 
because I could picture the sprue in my head that I've seen those before, and that's why I thought Dark Eldar, and now I'm wrong. It is the Black Elf Cor Corsairs. Black Dark Elf Corsairs. Black Ark. Black is, Ark. Is that what it is? Yeah, okay. Black Ark Corsairs. In that kit, they have hand crossbows, too. Okay. <sighs> so you can build three different kits in this one box. Ish. You know, okay. they, they so it's a bunch of unhelmeted heads, helmeted heads, a bunch of heavy weapons, special weapons, uh, a bunch of cool like banner things cherubs which i think you hate you hate baby cyborg babies right <laughs> fucking weird yeah, yeah a lot of that stuff um yeah just a lot of like weird religious zealot stuff that it's I'm, like their I'm version into. of the nurglings like some for some reason yeah. in the kits there's just a couple little fatty nurglings. everyone needs babies yeah who needs some in little 40k little fat pus babies or fat <laughs> robot babies one or the other what's the version of fat pus babies for space marines i don't think they have one I, scouts scouts I don't think are the they fat have pus babies of they don't have dogs like that's the thing i always figure like you're going full on the best for everybody army in space marines just give them dogs man like everyone if they don't already love your army now they're gonna love it because everyone loves doggos oh dude primaris doggos come yeah. on yeah man's best friend you could have like all of these different breeds they could just be printing money yeah. primaris doggo kits and they could have like like shoulder cannons Dude. and like laser eyes. But that means dogs are dying. I'm not cool with that. Yeah, that's true. What if they're holographic dogs okay. and the real good yeah. boy is back safe at home? Yeah, yeah. But he, he can like <laughs> connect himself with the neural link. You know what that reminds me of? <laughs> you ever seen Lost in Space? Uh, the movie? Yeah. Yeah. You Remember when that kid like pilots the robot in the hallway and all those spires are running down and he's like, fume, fume, fume. And he's not like actually there, but the robot is. Yeah, the robot is. But the robot's like a real character in that movie. So he still gets sad when sure. he gets eaten alive by spiders. Well, but it's not, no one actually dies. Right. You know, it's like in all the 80s and 90s cartoons where all the bad guys were actually robots. <laughs> like Ninja Turtles, all the foot soldiers are actually robots, but they <laughs> just look like bad guy ninja people. Same thing with G.I. Joe. They were all robots, so it was okay to kill them on Saturday morning. <laughs> None of the hu actual humans died. Yeah, Cobra Commander, what, what even is he? Yeah, well, he never died because he's a badass yeah. leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He always got But he still kind of looked like the regular ones. Yeah, he always like blew up in a, in, in a ship, but then he had a parachute and he was fine. He was yeah. like, oh, I'll get you next time. Yeah, or there was a little ship inside of a big <laughs> ship. <laughs> and it was just like, poof, big ship blows up. To, <laughs> and it just like shoots off into the moon. Right? Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, uh, moving on. Don, you said you had uh, food poisoning last night when I showed up today? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'm feeling good now. Yeah. Thank heavens. I'm, I'm glad because I brought you some McDonald's to you, and you're like, I had food poisoning last night. And I was like, well, maybe you don't want this. No, I'm like, come. Well, that did do a little bit of a number on my system as McDonald's will do when yes. I had nothing in my system. I had literally had cleansed <laughs> every orifice. <laughs> yeah, I went to D and D last night. I had a great time in D and D. This is how it's related to yeah. the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A great time of D and D playing our Wendy's campaign. Um, and I uh, came back home, got ready for bed. Just about midnight. I'm suddenly like, Ooh, tell my wife like, Ooh, I'm not feeling so hot. I'm going to go sit down in the bathroom, see what happens. And this was, the first time in my life that I needed a bucket while on the shitter. Oh my God. Cause it was sign I I did the whole like get, do I get do I sit do I get up? Do I sit up? Nope. I gotta do both. And there was no bucket in the bathroom. But my wife has this big like pitcher, like a big glass pitcher that she uses to fill up her tub when she does a big fancy bubbly bath stuff. Oh God. That was what was in there, so I had to grab it and ralphed in the pitcher. You just desecrated that. Yeah. She's never going to use that again. I should probably tell her I barfed it. Oh, no. You didn't tell her? I'll tell her after this. Please don't take a bath tonight, sweetie. It's going to be some pink it's chunks. A, you cleaned it out, obviously. Yeah, I, I mean, I rinsed it out. But, yeah, I was, <laughs> it was like... just rinsed it out? You know. Whatever. You didn't like use soap or anything? No, I mean, I'm, I... Dude, I was so sick. I wasn't concerned with that. I'll okay, I understand later. that. Okay, I'll do good. it later. Good. It's just so recent. <laughs> right. It's so, yeah, it was like 1230 by the time. It was like 30 minutes of hell. <laughs> Wondering if I'm going to survive. <laughs> and, okay, so here's the other great part about this. So we know that my cat Dobby is an asshole. And I have this um, thing where I, I don't close the door all the way. Usually when I'm in the bathroom, in our, old, in our master bathroom, I still just close it, but I don't like 
latch it. And so what Dobby does is he, if I do that, he fucking Kung Fu Chuck Norris kicks down my front door every time. <laughs> like he headbutts and it goes, poof, and he like someone kicks in your door. And then he just walks in and stares at what's going on and he turns around and leaves. So I'm in there shitting and barfing everywhere. My wife's trying to sleep in the next room and he goes, poof, kicks the door in. And I'm like, Whoa! and he just looks at me. And he's like, the hell are you doing? And he leaves. I'm like, oh, great. Well, my wife and I have our 10 year anniversary this year. So now she's heard, seen and smell everything. <laughs> Every kind of liquid you can produce. She's experienced it. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I was nervous this morning. I was going to feel like crap. But after, you know, it's great. Whenever you have a good, proper purge barf. Yeah. You, you very rarely feel better than right after. It's like, I think there's some chemical thing that happens in the brain that yeah. makes you feel so good after. So I felt like, dude, I could just go run a marathon and, you know, arm wrestle Arnold Schwarzenegger or something <laughs> right after that. I think it's because of the comparison, right? Oh, right. You were just in such a, in such dire straits. Yeah. And then you just, now you feel so fantastic by comparison. Cause I'm yeah. sure there are other moments when you actually feel way yes, better than that's that. that's true. That's true. I'm not sure. But, um yeah but then maybe that's why maybe that's why like roller coasters are so great because you feel so much like you're about to die <laughs> and then you don't so yeah. you're like woo yeah you value life more because yeah. it's a near-death experience i think it's the same thing barfing in roller coasters <laughs> what if you barfed on the roller coaster <laughs> oh my god that'd be like euphoria <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that is the best version of life right there <laughs> all right uh last bit of the preamble Recently, I uh, did a, a video on my channel about a community event. Uh, I like the idea of community events, but I don't do them a whole lot. Um, but this one's for charity. It was celebrating hitting 100,000 subscribers, um, which happened a year ago or something. Uh, yeah, a little tardy. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, there's a lot of red tape when it comes to setting up an online charity raffle. That's like three stages of legality you have to work out. So in the end, I was like, let's have someone else do it. Yeah, and that's always someone, the best idea. That's someone else's Nova, because that's exactly what they do. Right. They raffle off miniatures, like stuff we paint uh, for charity. So they help me out, and you have some some, some questions or some concerns probably about the uh, logistics of this operation. I have, I have concerns. Scott. Yeah, no, I mean, I thought about it, but hit me with it, and I'll tell you. Okay. So I watched your video, and it came out offering you saying hey everyone go sign up here clicky click here clicky click sign up here um all the spots were taken all the miniatures were were taken for Six people hours. to paint in a ridiculously short amount of time and okay so and for those who didn't see how many options there were there were four lists of very large armies uh i, I mean like each army is like 150 to 200 models God. And they're broken down by units of 10 or like a single character, like five vehicles, six vehicles, whatever it is. They, there's, there were so many options um, and they were all gone. My immediate response to seeing them all gone in like before the end of the afternoon on day one <laughs> was like, oh no, <laughs> that's too fast. That's too fast. That, those, are, those were all spoken for too fast. And yeah. why I thought too fast, I'm like, I think there needs to be a, a mental walkthrough process yeah. before you commit to something like that. And by all of them being gone so fast, I'm like, did you people really do it? Did you really walk through it in your brain? Do the, you do the calcul calculations, calculations <laughs> of how long it's going to take you. Do I have the right paints? Yeah. Do I know, is this going to work for my schedules? Is anything right. going on? Right. School starting up. Do I have kids and all these things? Like, I'm just like, Oh gosh, I really hope people, put the proper thought process in so they know they're going to be successful. Right. I'm just worried about you've got to manage how many different people is it going to be like a hundred? Something like a hundred. Yeah. You have to manage a hundred people to make sure that they get their shit all done. Yeah. In a month. Yeah. That's scary, man. Yeah. So the, the very real concerns. Um, so I have every single person who was applied. I have all of their emails and my plan is to do, weekly check-ins with them and if they don't respond to replace them with someone else mm. like very early on in the process the earlier the better obviously um 
So uh, otherwise, there are people who are painting duplicates of things that were on the list. And I was telling you about this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, accidentally, uh, quite a few people signed up for things that were already taken due to like a software issue with the ad and I was using with Google Forms. And that might actually be a good thing because it might cover some people who are not able to finish what they're able to finish. Yeah. I think you might have that be a little happy little accident there. Yeah. That happened. Yeah. So I guess, yeah. So it's not a good solution, but the solution I have is weekly check-ins, reminders in every single video from now until when the event ends. And just a little bit of gold fashioned prayer to the, <laughs> right. the old JC. The old <laughs> crossy old pinkies. Yeah. Um, we'll see how it works out. Originally, this is how I wanted to do this. I wanted this army to be the biggest army ever. And so what I wanted to do was have a form set up with percentages, meaning like, okay, in an army, 5% is HQ, 50% is uh, core troops, 30% special, 15% is vehicles. I think that's 100. I might have messed up. <laughs> Um, doesn't matter. And I wanted people to like, like looking at, going to the form to sign up for what they want to sign up for. And like on the right is like a pie chart of like, this is what the current volunteers have signed up for. Please pick a unit that, uh, make sure that the percentages are near this. So there is no cap. People just oh. can keep picking. Um, and, uh, Nova was like, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and I was like, why? And they were like, well, you know, there's more appeal to four different armies and the armies are more usable when they're like a, a normal size for an army and right. not like a bazillion. Uh, so it's like, okay, some Ten, point though, I'm going to do that. 10,000 points. Yeah. I want some freaking huge, like 500 model con army, you know, something crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's cool if you get it because you have all your options covered. You could play a 2,000 point game with whatever the hell you want. With, yeah. Because you got it all. Because you got everything. <laughs> yeah. I get their point, though, too. Yeah. Yeah. They want to be useful. And you're going to raise more money if you have four different armies auctioned off rather than one gigantic one. Yeah. But it'd be a spectacle, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. I suppose it would. Come on. Come on. <laughs> a spectacle. Yeah. So, yeah. We're, we're going to hope that it's going to work out. But um, I have another concern. Yeah. And it has to do with the United States Postal Service. Yeah, fucking idea. USPS is uh, sucking fat cock right now. It's, it's, we're in a tumultuous uh, time for uh, getting and receiving packages in yeah. our country. International. And international, yeah, international is Locally scary. is fine. It's, it's not terrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, I mean, I've had some stuff that it, it's taken a little bit longer yeah. than what expected or what was sent to me as predicted. Yeah. But internationally, it's suddenly, Real nervous, real quick. Yeah. So in dealing with your timeline, that was my other major concern. Yeah, no, that's a great concern. I intentionally posted the video late, not at 5 a.m. I posted it at 9 a.m. Uh, this is actually another accident. <laughs> I tried to post it at 5 a.m., but I scheduled it for the next day at 5 a.m. And then I woke up at 9 a.m. and Amber was like, your video's not posted. And I was like, oh shit. Um, so then I went and posted it, but it actually was a great idea because the first viewers are a mixture of Europe and United States. Whereas uh -huh. normally at 5 a.m. it's exclusively European, yeah. which means that they would get the majority of the things. <gasps> so 9 a.m. Was, was perfect. Um, it could have even been a little bit later, honestly, so that the sure. West Coast was awake and doing stuff by then. Sure. Um, but yeah. They're not up at seven? Come on, West Coasters. No, God, they, yeah, they work 10 to six over there. They're yeah. weirdos. Yeah, well, it's all about dealing with traffic and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Then that's just Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I think that was probably pretty good too. Not that you're not going to appreciate and want European painters to paint. No. Yeah. It's just the, yeah, the postal service right now sucks. Yeah. Um, I get so many questions, not so many, but I get a few about like, Hey, my Duchess has been en route for two months. Where is it? And luckily none of them have been lost in the postal service. They all show up eventually so far. Um, but yeah, I, I just have to be like, man, I'm sorry. They're just they're just taking forever. I don't know why. Um, but eventually they all show up. But yeah, two months is yeah. Ridiculous. The it's that cust whatever postal customs office or something. Is I had I ordered something from China, and from when I ordered it until it hit San Francisco, it was like six days. It's like God damn, that's pretty that's pretty quick. Yeah, that is fast. And then it sat in San Francisco for. Two straight weeks. I don't even know what the problem is. What's the problem? I don't know. There's something with like mail-in ballots and like 
po politics and like yeah. Amazon's going to buy USPS and I hear all these things. I never really look into it though. I don't know. I, I don't. It's honestly just going to just give you more stress. Yeah. And it's not worth it. But yeah. It's not yet to the point where we're dealing with stuff related to um, election. That's there's all the fear with with the way the postal service is working and yeah. mail in ballots and stuff. But I don't think that's what's dealing right now. Okay, I think it is some connection to COVID. It's got to be, yeah, because yeah, it should have the fan when that all started, right? And so it's either from a logistics standpoint of them having enough staff in there to work safe and to and that could just push back timelines, mm -hmm. or they've added new um, weight steps in place yeah for covid on the surface or something i oh, don't yeah, know maybe like disinfectant period yeah, 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 yeah right yeah like a quarantine <laughs> for the packages for your packages <laughs> yeah especially ones from china right oh jesus. gosh jesus Ugh. um yeah so that's that's fun my uh i, I want to paint something for the charity army obviously um and uh, a viewer reached out to me and they're like, hey, I have some Primaris lieutenants and these other things in case people who are painting don't want to buy them. And they just, they, I will happily donate them. And I was like, that's amazing. And one of the people he had was uh, uh, Sister Tariana Palos. Do you know who this is? Someone, SOBs, <laughs> when, they, <laughs> <laughs> when they first got released, they had a few custom sculpts. And they were of just normal sisters. They're not like canonesses or like leaders or anything, but you can obviously use them like that. But one was called uh, Amelia Novena, and then one was called Tariana Palos. And Tariana's sculpt is amazing. It's based on a concept for them, and so is the Amelia one. It's based on a concept of uh, Karl, Kap Karl Kapinski. But they're both, I like the, uh, uh, what did I say? What was her name? Palos? Tariana Palos? I like that one more. But I love that model so much. I was like, dude, I will paint that one for the community event. So I want to paint that one. Um, and I'm excited about the paint scheme too, the metallic red thing. I'm going to experiment with that yeah. and have some fun with it. Um, but yeah, I'm going to paint that I'm for trying, the charity event. I'm trying to search up. Tariana Palos. All right, John has seen. I've seen that sister. Seen and he, he has my, he gave me his blessing. Uh, he, he it's did a pretty it. cool. It's a pretty cool sculpt. Thank you. I was thinking you were gonna get one, like one of the anniversary or special limited edition lieutenants that they have a bazillion of. Oh yeah, there's so many. I got one or two over in the cupboard of shame over there. Oh yeah, still in the box. Are you waiting to sell them for some fat cash? No, I've sold the ones I think I'm gonna sell. Yeah, I think this one I, I had a reason why I got it. There was a, there was a reason I can't remember it. Did you get it for free at Depticon? Probably. Yeah, but there's a reason I was gonna keep it. I had a, I had a oh, plan. Oh, this is for your diorama? No. <laughs> this is for YouTube. Oh, clicks. this is the dude holding the helmet under his arm. Yeah, it's like four of those, probably. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. No, no. I think what you're talking about. Does he have a receding hairline? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah. You know what's badass? <laughs> receding hairlines. <laughs> <laughs> they make, they just show that you're a grizzled veteran. Well, yeah. I You've hope. seen some shit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For, for my sake, I hope. <laughs> Dude, you can't get over worrying about your hairline, and it's hilarious. Oh my gosh, dude! I'm twenty. I feel like I see the problem with me is that I'm 28, but I look like a 16 year old. Yeah, I know that. I feeling. look like a 16 year old with a receding hairline. What the fuck? I know that feeling. What's wrong with me, dude? I had when I was in high school. I had two. My class was tiny. I had two guys in my class. They had like half the hair that you had before they graduated <laughs> high school. Ironically, they could both grow like full beards in high school, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, well, you know what? It's a trade-off I wouldn't choose. <laughs> but such is life. You don't get much say in it. <laughs> right, right. All right. Anything else you want to talk about in the preamble, John? No, I don't have anything else. I think we talk, we covered it all. I'm very excited to talk about what you painted. Oh, is that what we're doing next? Let's get into that. <sighs> I think I... I think I doubled the amount of models I've painted in my life in the last week. <laughs> Probably more than doubled. I've painted 71 models in one weekend. Yeah. A 2,000 point Age of Sigmar army. That is amazing. It's done. And I'll tell you this. I'm so excited just to settle in and listen to Papa John talk about this experience. It was not as hard as I had expected it was going to be. It was not... 
It was not what we make it out to be in our heads when we look at all the models we have or yeah. when we think about our full list and all that stuff. It's not so difficult. If you do a couple of very important things, number one, you must get approval from your spouse <laughs> to spend an entire weekend nothing but painting. Yeah. That is the most important step. Because <laughs> if you don't have this, Nothing else will go successfully. <laughs> you will not get those models painted. And number two, you have a plan that is written out and you confirm that you like the final result because you should not be thinking. You should just be doing. Yeah. I, I don't want to be decision-making at this step. So I did a test model and I was happy with where he was at. Did I tweak some things off of that? Yes, but very little. And those tweaks happened at the very end when it was like five thirty, six o'clock on Sunday, and I basically just had black rimming of the bases to go. Oh my gosh. And I'm that's like, amazing. I'm like, I think I wanna mess with some blood splatter. You know? I think I wanna tweak a little bit what I was doing with the vertigree stuff that I did. I don't wanna do it exactly like I did. So I gave myself a little bit of time to think through and make changes. Okay. And luckily those changes weren't terrible because then I just proceeded to do them all those steps on 71 models. So if it would have looked like garbage, that would have sucked. Yeah. Um, it's not that hard though. There are some steps that suck balls, namely base coating with a brush. Yep. Every little bit of cloth and armor. And stuff. That took so much time. Yeah. Man, okay. So this video is going to be a collaboration between me and John. Mm -hmm. And it should be out the Friday before this podcast Yeah, you airs. should be able to see it. So yeah, it'll be linked in the description below. Um, John had a great idea. Probably like six months before his channel had released a video. <laughs> yeah. But which is fine. You're thinking about ideas. About painting an army in a weekend. And I was like, that's a great idea. And yeah, me being a good friend, I was like, I didn't steal it and make a video about it. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so yeah, I want to do it too, but I'm concerned. Um, As I, we sit right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine's not done yet. My, the sky hasn't even started is yet. I need to do some final assembly and I'm starting this Monday as Friday evening. Yep. And then Tuesday, Wednesday as Saturday, Sunday, which leaves one day to edit the video. One day. Yeah. As per usual. My planning is pretty shit. Uh, <laughs> Amber hates that uh, about me is I'm pretty terrible when it comes to thinking ahead of time. Um, but I'm concerned your army is very uniform and aesthetic. And I feel like mine is not as uniform. So I'm concerned that I'm going to get bogged down painting the various specific details for each model that I have. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned. I'm hedging right now. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to, I, I don't see a fucking world where I finish. I think you can do it. I think I think what, the week. Coven Throne, Neferata. All right, you, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some wisdom right give now. Give me some wisdom. I'll give you some wisdom, Daddy John. What you need to do is you need to find out what's going to tie them all together from a color scheme perspective. Yeah, and you are going to replicate that across all steps. Maybe the red here for the armor is not exactly the way it's going to be on the zombie dragon, but those colors will still all present themselves. So you'll have your full list of here's my bone. Here's my armor. Here's my cloth. Here's my skin tone. Here's my whatever. And you have your gen generic off dark gray that this is the dark gray. I'm going to use for everything. Yeah. For this one, it's going to be the hair for this one. It's going to be the belt. For right, this whatever. right. So you have to limit the amount of colors. I think that's the number one thing that could really hang you up is you use more than like eight colors. Right. Cause it's just gonna, it's just, it takes so much time. Cause not only are you adding more steps for yourself, but then you are physically for this little bit of purple, you're still gonna have to double check every single model. Is there any purple here? Is there any purple here? Instead of look, I'm using this kind of plum gray plum color over here for something. I'm just going to use that here, even though right. it's not my ideal perfect color, or whatever. Sure, you got a lot of little details, but you need to you need to unify them and say, I'm not going to do four different kinds of metallics on this. Yeah, like you did last time. <laughs> I mean, does it really take that much longer? To yes, have... yes, it does. <laughs> okay, how much longer? Is it like five minutes? No, it's not five to minutes. get a paint out and put it on your palette. That's the only added time. Okay. If, if, and if. 
you have all your steps written down. Yeah. And you are just going through the motions. Yeah. It's not going to be that extra time. But you don't have that written down. Well, okay. No, I don't. I'm going to. That's part of what I'm going to do today as well. Okay. Um, and I have a lot of the colors established from when I painted the wolves and the yes, knights. Yes, that's a good thing. Yeah. Lean into that. What colors did you already use? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, if you use a gold and you use a, a silver, that's great. Yeah. Do not get into black lining. Do not get into all that kind of stuff. That's going to eat your time, man. Well, my hope is, is that I can get the black lining done uh, with Tamiya panel liner. And then at the end of a day... And then the next day, I'll clean it up, and then that'll be the first thing I do on the day. I mean, you did that with streaking grime. Yeah, with streaking grime is... Well, it's the same thing. It's an enamel wash. I know, but with streaking grime, it's so much different because I did everything in a base coat. So all the colors were on the model, and then I just airbrushed streaking grime the entire model, and then the whole thing <laughs> cleaned it up, squeaky clean. And that was it. When you think about how much time on a model-to-model -model basis that took... It's it's way faster. Now, that step does wait, wait, take wait, wait, a wait, long wait, wait, wait. time. Hold on. Airbrushing streaking grime and then wiping it off with white spirits is faster than just straight up applying panel liner? Yeah. You have to have like a fat-ass brush and I'm just like pfft-ing it on? Oh, you, you, oh, so you're not even like trying to get into the, into the lines? In it the goes to the lines. If I sm slap on a gloss varnish, that'll help it even more. Oh, don't add that step. Why not? That'll help it. I know, but you're adding a whole step of gloss varnishing the entire now that you're also committing to then matte varnishing it all again at the end before you're done too that's fine man that's just added two more steps yeah but hear me out here if i'm using matte tones i feel like the wash is going to stain the color more because it clings to it more so if i slap on a little glossy gloss maybe i'll do a satin one i like satin varnishes it's good for gaming models and then it'll help me with a little bit of that surface adhesion yeah maybe you know, it'll be the finished, it'll be the finished, finished, it'll be the finished, finished, finish, finished, finished, right there. I don't know. This is what I'm thinking. Uh, well, Wait, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. If I just slap it on with a fat brush, the, the panel liner, isn't that, 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 that's no better or worse than what you did with streaking grime. In fact, I think it's better. I, I had pictured when you were talking about panel liner that you were actually using it to panel line. That's where I was like, like, like bing, bing, bing. No, yes. I'm just like, <laughs> getting on. If I was going to do that, I would just do an oil wash then. That's, it is an oil wash. It's the same thing. Is it? Are you just 100%. making a really expensive oil wash? Because, and why is it expensive? Because it, it's the same price as a giant tube of oil, which for your whole army, you just use like one squirt of to oil wash the whole thing instead of that $8 jug of panel lining. Yeah, no, it definitely is cheaper to do the oil, but there is some value into having a product already mixed. True, true. So true. I'm not going to think about it. Sure. You know, you just said that. Sure. You little, you little scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we'll see. You'll you'll know if Scott has a video about painting an army. Oh, I'll have a video. The question is, did I, did I finish? And the answer is 80% no. God, you're such a wimp. I'm not a wimp. I'm just realistic, okay? <laughs> I know my strengths are. My strengths are not painting fast. <laughs> Dude, you are a way faster. This is the one thing that you've always held above me is that you're a way faster painter than me because you do YouTube videos so you know how to paint fast. Like indiv now, individual models. Now. When the rubber meets the road, you're gonna have nothing. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, uh, I think batch painting armies is different than speed painting single models. Obviously, I think the, the, there's a whole planning thing. There's a whole limiting your palettes. So you're not like getting like 80 colors out. Mm. You know, there's some of that. Mm. We'll see. I'll try. Um, the army that I wanted to paint for this was the Legion of Blood, and then I didn't know when this was actually gonna happen, so I used that army for. Uh, the painting marathon video where I painted for 38 hours straight. Um, and uh, so I had to add extra models to my list to make it 2K points, mm -hmm. which sucks because the extra model I added was a fucking coven throne, <laughs> which is not exactly an easy model to paint. I don't know. It, it is not an easy model to paint if you want to get there and have all those really crispy details the way that yeah. they're in there. But... All the ghosts it's a are cool, easy. It's a good. It's a it's a cool, very kind of thematic piece at a distance too, and you can make it look really cool without getting all bogged down in every sure, one of yeah. details. Yeah, so. it's just like every other model in your army, right? You can choose to paint all the swords and the metallics of the horsey, ghostly guys, or you can just make them all a ghost color. You yeah. know, yeah, those, are, those are ghost lances. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So, yeah, I, I'm I'm curious to see how your years goes. I think what you could do from a time saving perspective in terms of editing is is what you would have that more of an opportunity and experience in doing than when I um, did would be to have the cameras rolling and kind of do like what you did with the jazz video where you can capture a lot of your actual commentary and everything in real time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, through multiple cameras and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. that might make your script writing and all that kind of stuff really non-existent. Yeah. That's the plan. The plan is to have time I've seen cameras and also that main cam. So I can just flick it on and talk to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'll be good. It'll be good. I, you know, you seem so cool as I am cool. You yes, are so cool. No, <laughs> I didn't mean you're cool. I mean, you're very relaxed. And uh, what the fuck is that face? Uh, no, you just seem like you're like, yeah, I have a whole pain in the army. Psh. For for a lot of people, myself included, it's kind of like a, what's the word that I'm looking for here? It's something people are chasing constantly. Sure. It's this fairy, you know? And like, you just knocked it out in a weekend and made all those people look like idiots, myself included, right? So you, why are you, you're not amped about this. Why are you not amped about this? I, um, you seem so like laissez-faire. You know where I'm going to be amped about it? I'm going to be amped about it this weekend when we sit down to play some Age of Sigmar with Vinci V Heck and yeah. Sam. Yeah. And I have a pain in the army for the first time in my life. Yeah. Then I'll be amped. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. Now, it's almost kind of like I'm in this point of, like frustration with myself. Why? Because oh. I have all these armies that I've had for like two years. I've got a full night haunt mm. army. I've got like six thousand points of of death. I've got like three thousand points of death guard for forty k, and none of that crap is painted. And I was like, I just did a whole army in a weekend. I could have like seventeen armies like Vince by now if I would actually <laughs> been doing this. It's not as hard as as we make it out to be. Here's the other thing too. And neither of us are doing this as part of the weekend. It's not building models. It's not priming. It's not priming. It's not basing models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And not because we're trying to cheat the system of finishing the weekend. It's because when I sat down and decided how I wanted to do this, this is the way that I want folks to be able to replicate it in real life. And in real life, on a Tuesday evening, I can assemble models for 45 minutes if I have time. Yeah, I can sit there and just apply all my little basing stuff or I can do the green stuff rollers to get all my bases stamped out and all that stuff. That is not something that I really get a ton of more value and efficiency in doing it spliced up. Yeah, Where it really counts is when you're sitting there with paint on your palette and models in front of you. That is where you can maximize the amount of time that you need to spend to accomplish the task. Just yeah. do it in one fell swoop. I mean, if I can play devil's advocate, there's definitely an argument to be made that setting yourself, setting yourself up for that kind of success definitely plays a role in getting that success, right? Mm. So it's, I mean, you could save time in the area of basing by not doing green stuff rollers and like having to break all those shards and apply that to the base. You could just do dirt and that'd be easy. Um, you could like have a very specific sub assemblies set up that would make your painting go faster. For instance, say you had cavalry and the cavalry was a uh, 90% one color and the rider was 90% a different color. So if you kept them separate, then you could airbrush one, two different colors and save time in masking. So right. there's, there's yeah. some value in that. There is some, there are some good steps there again. That's, and that is setting yourself up for success for the actual painting slog of mm -hmm. finishing it all. Right. But I would, there, I could see myself doing that exactly. If I had a cavalry army, like if I was playing, I'd not deep can. Yeah. And I had 35 eel riders. You've got to believe that those eels are not going to be attached to those riders. You got to believe. Gotta, you better believe it, baby. <laughs> but also the thing from the building perspective is to be honest with ourselves, most of us have a buttload of gray models yep. that we're using to play the game. Yep. We're yeah, still no, that's, playing that's very games. true. That's very true. Yeah. You know, we're playing. They're on bases. They're all out there and hitting the, hitting the stores to play our games. They're not painted yet. Yeah. This um, is the part that matters. Yeah. That's definitely true. Uh, it's it, like assembly seems like such a, an attainable goal for so many people, mm -hmm. right? You, you build, you buy this really big kit and you can put it together in a couple hours, whereas painting can, can take 10 or 20 hours. Um, speaking of taking multiple hours to put together a kit, it took me five hours to assemble Neferata. Is that par for the course or am I just slow? Dude, I, that was one of the first models I ever put together when I first started. <laughs> oh no. Uh, yeah. Because when I first got into the hobby, 
the first thing I bought was that start collecting. Oh, and it, yeah, it comes with the Mortark, yeah. Yep. And that was, I built that right away, and I'm like, this game is not very fun. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, um, so many mold lines oh, it's in terrible, that go terrible up and spines. down vertebrae and spines and things. And it's dang, terrible. dude, Amber was like, I can see why people pay other people to you know, like paint their stuff. It's taking you forever to do this. Because I was just sitting next to her while I was doing it. I was doing it outside because it was super nice yesterday. And yeah, it took me five hours. I also did it on stream and got absolutely nowhere <laughs> um, because it was so complicated and people were asking me questions. Um, but yeah, dude. That was... So that's rough when you're like, model. When you're like, oh, I got to build the coming through and I got to build enough rod. I'm like, dude, did you just pick like the two shittiest models to put together in the full <laughs> games workshop range? <laughs> <laughs> Cause both of those models are hell yeah. to put together. Yeah. So much time. So yeah. much time. It's like, Oh yeah. But wouldn't, aren't all big models hard to put together? No, not really. Aren't they're not. No. Like think about if you were to like compare Neferata to like the, um, Orc war boss, mega boss on Maw Crusher. On his cabbage. Yeah. Yeah. Like that is like bakunk, bakunk, bakunk. <laughs> and then three mold lines. It's totally different. Not that it's not also difficult. It's a big model with a lot of stuff, but it's like they are not all apples to apples. Okay. So you built the Night Titan, right? Not yet. No. Oh yeah, it's I have. It is yeah, and I have magnetized it. Yeah, I built it. Yeah. I forgot what I did. Um, yeah. That, yeah, you're right. That was, uh, that was pretty simple. Yeah. And that's a giant model. So. Yeah, it's bigger than Mortark for sure. Yep. Okay. All so right. uh, we know you haven't, well, you haven't painted, but what did you paint? What I painted this week was I had a little OSL. I don't want to know if I'd call it an experiment, but um, it was a thing for my one of my Patreon groups where we were all looking into OSL. And I would consider myself in this uh, period of phase, period of phase, hmm. this period of my life where I am figuring out OSL from a, not like a physics point of view. I understand, I think, the physics of how OSL work. I'm trying to now just actually make it work on the miniature. Because there's a difference between understanding how something works and also being able to accomplish it, right? Yes. And so I have, uh, just like with freehanding, which I'm not amazing at, but I'm okay at, um, I have so many just small uh, experiments of OSL where I'll do very small things, like someone has a hand that's on fire, and I'll like make the forearm have some OSL on it. Very simple LED thing, stuff like that. And as I progress, I do bigger and bigger things. Um, and this one was a, a shaman in my hate tribe, my Bulgar hate tribe from hate. Um, and I made her blades glowing and I wanted I wanted to be like a midday glow. So the top of her wasn't dark, but it was sunlit and the, her bottom half was lit by her purple blades. And I wanna say that I think this is probably one of the my better attempts at OSL mm -hmm. in recent history. Um, there were some problems with it still I was trying to figure out how to get like a really punchy purple. And of course the solution was to add in hot pink. And, but then, then of like, course. but then like, what color do you use for the OSL? Is it purple and hot pink? It's like a combination of those things. Um, so yeah, I painted the hate model for an, an OSL experiment. I haven't fully figured everything out about OSL yet, which is why I haven't made a video about it yet. But once I do, I'll make a video. Um, and then I also painted three, models for the charity army video a sister of battle um a necron and a thousand sun which that was kind of a challenge in and of itself because it was like i had guy help me with the ultramarines mm -hmm. he's good at making fast schemes so he did that one mm -hmm. i had duncan help me with the necron scheme mm -hmm. um, which was mostly okay i made some mo modifications to it so you had to buy less paints sure because his uh, his scheme was kind of just like it's kind of hard to think about it's like but people have to actually go out and buy this stuff so right. i limited some of the colors he used and then the sister battle one was one that I had to come up with. And so was a thousand sun one. So it was like really kind of a little mentally taxing to kind of figure out schemes that didn't use lots of paints and were easy to accomplish and looked okay. Um, but I think I did okay with them. Um, and it had like a nice, like kind of like escalation in, in, in difficulty as they, as the different sections went on. But yeah, that's what I painted. I liked it that, people could choose not only based on what spoke to them in terms of the models or whatever, which is a good choice if they want to help out yeah. to pick ones that excite them, but they could also pick,
pick based on the paint scheme that either is the most comfortable for them or that is drawn to them the most. Yeah. So I thought that that was really smart instead of like the way my brain would have worked through that. I would have made them all as equal as possible. Sure. And I don't think that would have been the right approach. I would have been like, okay, they're all going to use six colors and they're all going to use similar kinds of techniques to achieve those colors. And then people can just pick, but here it's like, well, no, by using a silver with a contrast over it, that makes that unique for that army. And it has a really kind of funky result. That's different than everyone doing the base coat of all the different materials yeah. and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I don't know if there's a right way to do it. Um, it's just kind of what happened naturally. Um, but yeah, that scheme for the sisters of battle is one that I wanted to explore more for my kill team. I want to do a metallic red and I want to try different ways of getting it. Um, starting with the Vallejo Illumina, but also putting Tamiya Clear Red over it. Mm. Um, because that one, Tamiya Clear Red is, uh, I think, a lot different than Contrast. Um, it's going to be even shinier. It's going to be so shiny. Yeah, I might need to hit that. So I, I think if I do Silver, Tamiya Red, Panel Liner, then a Matte Varnish, that could look really fucking mm. crispy. I'm interested to see how that would turn out. Yeah. The, see, the, the beauty of Contrast Paint is that it is, like Tamiya Clear Red, but also a wash at the same time. Right. So it gives you definition. Yes. It's actually a really good use of contrast paint. Um, so I need to figure out a way to replace that kind of, that depth that gives you for free. Mm. So we'll figure it out. Depth for free. Depth for free. That's how they should have advertised contrast paint. Okay. No. All Missed right. Missed opportunity. We should make our own contrast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get in on this. Make a Kickstarter and make a million bucks. Depth for free. <laughs> Offer it in a cool wooden box that it gets delivered to your door. In. Oh, now you're just making fun of someone. Oh, I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, once again, Scotty, we are sponsored this episode by our good buddies over at Dark Future Creations. Mm, love those guys. Created by mini painters for mini painters. Dark Future Creations strives to give us a connection between dark fantasy and cyberpunk settings mm, for all you anime lovers out there that also love sci-fi get a load of this guy dude this is my favorite model of their line that they sent us dude he is a ninja samurai he could he's got a little throwing knife in one hand he can put a katana he can put a nasty little pistol with a silencer on him yeah um he's got a lot of different options for bits and a crazy little base i don't have him on the base but trust me he's got a sweet base and also the cast is crispy yeah AF. <laughs> i just basically sniffed this off yeah there's still a little i mean there's a couple of things i probably need to go back and do but i just want to see what it look like in about 15 minutes of prep work and assembly so all the bits came together super smooth um just a little dab of super glue and hit the joints and as you can see there's no lines no it's beautiful speaking of this awesome samurai this is one in a trio in their new universe called cyber split which is part of a kickstarter that's launching in september mm -hmm. of 2020 and we'll have it linked down in the description uh, you can get all kinds of fun things in that Kickstarter, a lot of fun freebies, such as a step-by-step -step painting guide written by Matt Carnival that he wrote while he was painting the box arts for uh, the various models. And you can see that picture up right now. Speaking of box arts, they also have the legendary On Hill Heraldus in on that ish. Mm. And he painted that biker chick and it yeah. looks, I mean, it's perfect. It's perfect for his style. That, yeah. Like he created the infinity look mm -hmm. and these are kind of like big infinity models almost. Yeah. Um, so it works perfectly for that. And, and as you probably know by now, but if you don't, I'm going to say it again. These models have a variety of extra bits in them. For instance, this guy had a couple different heads. Like I said, he's got different weapon options. He's got these weird tentacle things that are like cyber tentacles like omega red from uh x-men omega from? red omega red you know who omega red is no he's one of the coolest villains of all of x-men and they don't have him in the movies because they're stupid oh. but he's got sweet <laughs> tentacles like that that hold a little lantern oh like a no. japanese yeah, lantern I love it. um so you get all the extra bits and some of the models can actually have totally different poses too because of the extra bits like that lady that is on her Bicicleta. And that bicycle is actually floating and is suspended in air by the Mini, right? Yes. Nice It's design. sweet. It's a, it's a hover bike yes. that is actually hovering. Yeah, yeah. That's a cool design. 
and all their miniature line in the Kickstarter come in your choice of sizes. Either the 32 millimeter gaming size, which you could use for proxying your badass HQs with these things, or 54 mil, which is what these are, right? Or are these 72? Those are 72, yeah. And this is 72. <laughs> so 54 <laughs> smaller than this. This would be the biggest size, which is would be great for display. So with the 54. I kind of butchered that. Thanks, Dark Future Creations. <laughs> Their Kickstarter features early bird pricing and also has friendly shipping for both NA and EU. So that's it. Once again, thank you, Dark Future Creations, for your support of Trapped Under Plastic and letting all the sprues and spruettes know about these sweet minis coming their way soon everything is linked in the description below if you want to check it out all right on to the topic which is basically about fanboys no no no. it's about if you could spend a day with any miniature painter and there wasn't a language barrier issue who would it be and why and this question was supplied by one of our patrons whose name is sinopole so, no so I've made it pretty clear in in past videos that uh, miniature painters are kind of like rock stars to me. They're yeah. cool. They're elusive. They're like, elusive? They, like they, they're hard to catch? Like they're all greased up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're just like, oh, God, <laughs> slips out. No. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of on a pedestal for me. It's like it's awkward to approach them, awkward to talk to them, stuff like that. Um, and of course they don't feel that way. And now I'm just picturing Banshee all lubed up in Vaseline. <laughs> He's so elusive. I can't squeeze him. <laughs> Slips out of my grasp. Um, this, this question I kind of struggle with because it's like, what's the difference between someone I want to spend time with and someone, and someone that I just like their painting style of, mm. right? And I think the difference is if someone's interesting, but also if they have a technique that I can't figure out how to do and would require me just to watch them, that'd be the kind of person I'd want to spend time with. Mm -hmm. Right? So a great person is, uh, Oh, you're just gonna jump right into the name, right? You're uh, gonna... Yeah. 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 Uh, his, his, he's, he's, he's a, he's a, mm. how many times do you say he's a, <laughs> and that's why I remember his name. <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a. It's Bohan. Um, uh, the oh, way wow. Bohan paints wow. is, uh, is super unique to him, right? Sure. And so just to be able to watch him paint and ask him why he paints the way he did and how he arrived at that style would be fantastic. We could walk through things like, he has this history of insane freehand, but it's not like freehand where he's like making like a mural on like a flag. Sure. It's like a pattern on a miniature, like all over it, like a like a cube pattern or some kind of thing, like some, some digital camo thing. Um, so to be able to sit and watch him paint would be helpful to kind of digest what he's doing and why he's doing it and things like that, which mm -hmm. isn't as apparent in videos and stuff like that. Sure. Um, some things, and I was uh, pooping earlier and thinking about this question. John has pooped twice in the recording Dude, of this This is podcast. what happens when everything is flushed out of my system and then you give me McDonald's and my body's like, what is this? <laughs> Exit. Get, get it out of here. <laughs> nope, there's still some in there. Get out of here too. <laughs> Um, okay, so I was thinking, and there's some, some things that I think are really important in deciding this, what my answer is going to be. And I think this is kind of a good general oversight to actually taking a one-on-one -on -one painting experience with somebody in general. And the number one thing is that when you're spending time in person with somebody, one-on-one -on -one is a totally different experience than even a full class with a dozen people or 20 people or a virtual learning experience like through Twitch or a, a YouTube video, something like that. There's something that is possible in a one-on-one -on -one experience that isn't possible in any other way in this hobby. Yeah. Um, what is it? There's, there's actually, there's two sides to the same coin. Okay. Side number one is the actual up close right next to them watching the tangible work that they do stroke by stroke and getting consistent questioning and answering of you saying how much pressure are you applying is there a is there a reason why you're doing really quick short strokes um and just them answering while they're actually giving you the the physical um ooh, kind of lost myself there <laughs> <laughs> 
No. <laughs> why did you lose yourself? What happened? I don't know where I was going. No, no, no. I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I've taught two private lessons before, and they're about four hours long each. And the ability to be able to, because I was able to finish the step before the person finished it, because I was familiar with what I was doing, and they were learning what they were doing. So when I finished my step, I could just set it down, and I just sat there, and I watched them paint. Yes. And like I bombarded them with like like feedback and things like that. And I was like, try doing something, try doing it a different way. Try doing this. Like, uh, and, uh, it was probably stressful for them, but it's kind of like the stress. That's like a good stress where it's like, you kind of undergo this period of growth. And then you, later you sit down and you think about everything that you were, you know, experimenting with and, and, and trying out and you start to incorporate new things in your painting regime. But yeah, being able to sit there and watch what they're doing incredibly valuable. Now I have a question about the topic for today. Is this specifically, is this uh, someone you want to get a one-on-one -on -one lesson from or someone you just want to hang out with? That's a good question too. Yeah. Um, and that's what I kind of was leading up to how I would choose to make my decision if I could do this with one person and only one person. And it's like a lesson thing. Right. Okay. So I was saying the flip side of that coin is not only the immediate engagement to what they're doing and why they're doing is they're showing you first but yeah. then as you said the flip side is them dissecting and in the moment telling you things whether it's talking about paint dilution whether it's talking about getting wicking off some of that paint on your brush before you're applying yeah because you get too much in there yeah tiny little things that you're doing that can that all kind of pile onto each other to equal your final result of your painting work yeah and they're showing you in the moment their recommendations of ways that you can improve the kinds of things if you watch a video or even if you're in a class of 20 people you don't get as much of that or maybe enough to really take a big jump up in mm -hmm. the quality of your painting for that so how that applies to who i choose is i'm not necessarily concerned with somebody that they have a specific technique or style that i want to emulate so a great example would be like a Mike, Michael Pasarsky. He has this crazy smoothness, especially with metals, that even though I would love to sit with him and learn how he does that, I'm more interested in a person that, from what I know of these painters at a distance, I know would be great at that constant feedback and interaction and teaching mentality. Yeah. Because there are a lot of amazing painters out there that aren't necessarily amazing teachers. And maybe they are, but that's not how I know them. So my list quickly goes short. Okay. Um, and you're, you're taking us from the angle of the reason you're hanging out with these people is to, to have a private lesson in to miniature a, painting. To have a private lesson in miniature painting. That makes sense. I think they're all interesting to me. Right. Like if I want to hang with somebody to just have an amazing experience while painting ben cantor yeah <laughs> ben, ben cantor is that person yeah. and you will have no idea where the conversation is going <laughs> or what you're going to be doing you might ask the question how many uh peanut butter filled m&ms would fit in the volume of the earth yeah and then you'll spend the next 45 minutes sitting in a van <laughs> trying to determine that answer to that question <laughs> yeah I don't think we ever did kind of get to the answer, but Benjamin But was, damn, did we fucking try? <laughs> yeah, we did. Dude, all mental math, too. We wrote nothing down. <laughs> no, no. It was like our three brains were computers. <laughs> our, three, our three brains formed a supercomputer. Yeah. No, there was one, four. One of us was figuring out the volume of a, of a, of a peanut butter, M&M. Yes. The other one was figuring out the volume of the earth and like, okay, now I got to do some division here. <laughs> Jake was in there too. Jake the, was in there too. The yeah, we had yeah. four brains. Yeah. We had a 25% more brain capacity. <laughs> yeah. And Jake's a lawyer, so he, we really needed him <laughs> yeah, in this. We, we did, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. If I'm doing that <laughs> for having an amazing experience with someone, especially someone whose brain doesn't work like mine and how they approach painting, Benjamin Cantor is a great one. Oh yeah. That, you can really break down how your way of thinking and explore yourself to a totally new kind of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It's Sam Lenz is another obvious one for oh, that yeah. group. Yeah. Um, I have from our class that we've taken with Sam and spending time talking with Sam and hopefully in this upcoming weekend, spending more time with Sam and learning from Sam. I have learned so much from a tangible takeaway and become a better painting standpoint. But why Sam is so great is because Sam is also just 
a fucking riot to hang out with. Yeah. And he's just such an interesting dude. Yeah. And um, so there's that. But I get Sam and Vince this weekend, so I can't pick them. Because mm. I'm already going to get that. <laughs> okay. 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 And I want to pick somebody who there probably is a language barrier because part of the question is language barrier free here. Right. Right. So I need to take advantage. Okay. Take advantage of this. Yes. Hypothetical. Hypothetical. Because I think that's a really important point in this. Because language and how we describe things that are not so nuts and bolts, cut and dry phrasing, there can be huge, huge hangups when it's not your primary language yeah. of how you describe really minuscule things. So we're talking about very, you know, finite, tight, little techniques. And if you don't have pure mastery of that language, it's not really comfortable to just flow off your tongue. It can be really hard to share that stuff. Right. And what you think you're saying and what they're interpreting as could cross the wire somewhere. And then you're just not making the connection to learn how you'd want to learn. Right. Or what really is most valuable. Not that you can't, and we haven't learned from people who are English second language speakers. Oh, yeah. If it's one and one, and I'm going to be shooting them with questions. Questions, right, constant questions. Left yeah. and right. Yeah. You know, we don't want to, you know, the barriers might come up. Right. So if I'm thinking about someone when I look at their their body of work <clears throat> and I think about the quality of their painting, their reputation in the industry as a teacher. Oh man, say the person I'm thinking of right now. Okay. There's I have three. Okay, I've I have two that I want to talk about as well. Look, keep, keep going. Okay, so my list is three and I'd be hard pressed to choose which one I would choose. Okay. The one I know which one I would choose because I'm a fanboy. Yeah, but you okay, yeah, okay, now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um it doesn't need to be one person. Okay. I don't, yes, yes, yeah. Of course, I know you're talking about, but keep going. Big old Burger King. Yeah. Big old BK. <laughs> BK? Oh, the king himself. <laughs> Um, so, so there's three and I know that there's more out there, but these are the three names that came to my head. Number one is Ben Comets. Of course. And not just because Ben, in my eyes, is kind of the godfather of an insane display quality, but also his paint style doesn't have its roots as closely tied to the Spanish style, the Spanish Italian painter style, sure, which is different than kind of a, a traditional European style and what you'd call some kind of melting pot of the American style. A, pan a Spanish painting style is a very distinct look. And I really like it, but I appreciate how Ben's pieces just look so different than a Spanish painting style and mm. so much realism. Um, and, and kind of crazy trueness of color instead of exaggeration. Okay. Which is oftentimes the Spanish and Italian styles more, more exaggerated. It's more painterly. Painterly. Great, great description. Number two would be Banshee. Okay, yeah. Because... This, this is one of mine, yeah. Banshee, it, it, I, I won't... You have had an experience with them. <laughs> that sounds so <laughs> ominous. <laughs> You had, yeah, he had the Vaseline <laughs> covered. He was um, so hard to get. Yeah, he just like, get to corner him. He's like, can't get me. <laughs> um, but I've heard nothing but praise for his ability to inspire and empower. Yeah. And his uh, qualities of, of incredible teaching ability. Yeah. So that is why I'm drawn to him. Obviously... He's, he's an amazing painter too, but just the way that I see his mind works is very um, traditional. I don't mean traditional in a negative way, a traditional art thought process. Yeah. And how he approaches this is truly in ways that historically Renaissance painters would approach uh, a canvas art. So, I just had an idea. Okay. We should make a stretch goal for the podcast. That is, we'll have Banshee as a guest on our podcast. Okay. And how we get them here is we fly to Spain. We do a two-on-one two on one lesson with him. Yeah. Record the podcast in the evening and, yeah. and get get all that done. And then we get a lesson from him. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that, yeah. Two-on-one. I love that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Then it's a business expense. Yes. And we could go to Spain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat so much tapas. Woo! <laughs> and Spanish omelets. Yes. Okay. Oh, baby. Okay. And what's that? 
ham, that amazing ham that they call mm. have, that's like smoked and it's still in the bone. Damn it, I can't think of the name of it. But it's supposed to be like the best ham in the world. Whoa. And they like they have it really thin sliced and it's just like sitting on a like a Flintstone style meat and a bone thing on their on their counter. They just slice it off whenever they want it. it sounds amazing. It is it just like melts in your mouth. Okay, we're gonna have that too. Yeah. Put that on the checklist. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um Okay, so so Banshee is is <clears throat> number two. Okay. I totally just ruined your train of thought. I'm sorry. No, I'll t- I, I'm with you. I, I want to go now. Okay. Okay. So while, while we're on Banshee, do you want to spend to talk about your stuff with him now? Yeah. I mean, I could just highlight what I've already said. So first of all, he, he's a teacher. He's taught tens, if not over a hundred now classes with people. So he has kind of his routine and his, his methodology probably figured out by now. Right. Yeah. But also, I did that class with him at Adepticon. I didn't even paint anything. We, we wasn't, it wasn't a painting class. It was like a, I'm going to amp you the fuck up class. Whoa. And uh, it, that happened. I was amped. So he, he is so impassioned, and his passion is so intoxicating that I left that class wanting to, to paint minis. And it was, it was a great feeling. So, yeah, definitely one of the people on my list that I want to hang out with or get a lesson from, whatever it is. He's, 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 he's cool. He's very passionate about, about painting. Did the class take place in like a high school locker room and you're all sitting on the benches <laughs> waiting to go out after halftime? It's halftime, we're down, we're down. Yeah. Home, home team's down by 10? <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Oh, He's also man. very passionate about miniature painting history. Uh, he, he feels like a lot of the attention is put on the wrong people about like who like uh, the, the big painters were. Because he, he, he was brought up by people like Julio Cabos and people like that. And he thinks those guys should be getting more recognition for what they did for miniature painting than uh, people like himself, people like Ben Comets, people like uh, uh, in that uh, time band of sure. painters. You know what I mean? There's like a, even an older one that I'm not even familiar with. Raul, yeah. Raul Garcia La Torre, he's kind of in that oh. area as well. Yeah, the, the shoulders on which they stood to get to wh- where we're at today. Exactly. And that's a really good point and not one I've spent a lot of time looking into because I'm not honestly much sure how much of that is cataloged and, and documented. Anywhere. I don't think it is at all. Yeah. Because there is a huge gap when you're looking, I think probably around, be around the, like the 90s, early 90s to early 2000s mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where there was a, there was in, there was a big jump in the late 90s to early 2000s, mid 2000s on the quality and the, the pushing the limits of the art form. And we're, we know about the people that really stood on top of that mountain after the mountain was erected, but we don't know who built it mm, as right. well. Yep. Right. Cause they had to get there Yep. and they weren't the necessarily all the, the only ones that did it for that time. So. Right. Right. Yeah. So the plan right now, uh, after I made that video about Roman Lapot, uh, Banshee reached out to me and said, you should make one like that for Julio Cabos. And I was like, sure. <laughs> I don't know anything about Julio, so it'd be super cool for me to figure all of it out. But I also like making videos like that, so it works. As long as you make a joke asking him if he lives down by the schoolyard. <laughs> <laughs> me and Julio down by the schoolyard. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so yeah, definitely Alfonso Raldez, a Banshee would be a fantastic candidate for this question. Mm-hmm. And I think he's a, would be really interesting. He's so like intense. He's yeah, he's intense. Yeah, right. I don't know how he has got a big sense of humor or not, but I feel like he. I feel like he. Be, he's game for anything. Okay. Because here's the thing, is if I'm gonna take a one on one with people, like as intense or as productive or whatever it's gonna be, I can't take anything seriously. <laughs> and so I don't want to just get to have someone so pissed off at me. It's like. You know, John, we are here for 10 hours and you are not working hard. You are making all the fun of the things. How are you to play D&D with? You just take the piss out of everything? Dude, yeah. I, I, I take the piss. I put it in the jug. I take it down <laughs> to the... Fucking drink it. Yeah, I, I put it in my mouth. I light a lighter and I spit it and blow it up in your face. That's it. Yeah. I, I take nothing serious. Although when I'm a DM, I'm pretty serious. Interesting. Because we need to make sure it's the maximum fun by being serious um i take i take the responsibility and the act of managing the game serious okay it does not come across to at the table as as being very serious okay i have dramatic points dude i love the high horror fantasy campaign okay i want people getting their butt cheeks sliced off by vampires and did you call it high horror yeah high horror what is, what even is that? You smoke a lot of weed. 
<laughs> and then <laughs> then you play D and D. You play D and D with the lights off. <laughs> Get a little flashlight under your chin. You're like, I'm freaking out, man. I can't see anything. Where's my minis? I don't even know if I'm on the board. Um, wow, that derailed. Yeah. So I need somebody that's gonna have uh, a fun time. So if you spruits and spruits are like, gosh, you know, I'd like to do that. I'd like to, you know, have a ton of fun and learn some painting stuff. You should pick me. <laughs> you better be careful. You're going to get some serious inquiries about doing private one-on-ones. Oh, okay. $15,000. <laughs> Jeez. See, now that's easy. Now I don't have any. No, it wouldn't be $15,000. <laughs> Contact me to figure out what it is. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> King. Amber, I need you to put that little that little thing where you go, King. <laughs> She's not going to do that. No. I don't, I don't know how to do that, so that's why I want to ask her. <laughs> Can you teach me how to do it, Amber? Um... All right, number three. Number three. The third one on my list. Francisco Farabi. 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 Why Farabi? Farabi because when I entered Crystal Brush and I placed second place at Crystal Brush. Fuck you. <laughs> the head judge was Farabi. And he's done that number of years has been lead judge and he judges at a lot of competitions he judges at monte san Savino. yeah yeah oh he kind of like runs that show yeah almost. yeah yes i mean he's he has his his tendrils in so many things but the thing that that really interests me is that farabi is a teacher farabi is an amazing painter and he's got something that nobody else on the list has to probably his regard and that is the understanding and the experience at judging at the highest of levels for years and years and years and so when i'm going to spend time with him not only is he going to be giving all that feedback and learning to be a better painter because he's an amazing painter but the conversation can also be focused on what aspects of the painting really make them stand out when you're looking at the highest level painting and competitions and judging and what is looked at. I want to have that constant cycle of feedback and stream of discussion happening in that one-on-one -on -one time. Mm -hmm. Seemed like a good answer. I agree. You know, another reason why Frabi is a great answer is because he doesn't wholeheartedly subscribe to the style of Spanish painting yeah. or Italian painting. Uh, you can tell uh, when something is painted by Francesco. He has mm -hmm. a very distinct high contrast look. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that'd be cool to- High saturation. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. I think last week, one of, one, his Thronecast Eternal was one of my favorite favorite painted models for that like Fortnite that we were talking about. That was a cool model. Uh, he also won Best in Show at Crystal Brush the last year it went on, right? Yep. With his- uh, Chimera Chimera? Chimera and Chimera. Do, do With the Spear. Right. Oh, it's fighting. He was on a Pegasus fighting a Chimera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Manticore. Manticore. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, It'd be funny if it was Chimera, Chimera, because Chimera is the name of the company, but they oh, also produce the Chimera. They kind of do that at some point. Yeah, they gotta. Right. Why right. wouldn't you? Their logo has a picture of a Chimera head. So. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great option. I thought about this a little bit more, and I was like, I wanna, I'd wanna talk to people or learn from people who are subject matter experts in a certain field, and so I thought, I thought of two people. I thought of uh, Angel Angel Geraldes, not Alfonso, because of his experience with airbrushing. Mm. Uh, airbrushing is so integral to his process, or at least it seems like it is, that he probably knows so much about it that he doesn't say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when you get so familiar with something. And so just to be able to see him operate in terms of like how much uh, pressure he's applying on the trigger, how much he dilutes his paint for a given step, like what kind of like pattern he's like, is he, is it circular? Is it square? Is it hexagonal? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. Is he going back and forth <laughs> like this? Yeah, he's just like jackhammer. <laughs> uh, so just to see that would be really cool. But another person I thought of was uh, Mark Musclone, who has a, a very uh, specific yeah. style, but also he paints so many busts and so many large scale figures that he probably has a really cool approach to it. And I've seen some of his step-by-steps on Facebook um, where he starts with this very dramatic layered look and then kind of smooths it out as time goes on. He recently did the box art for that like uh, that sci-fi looking uh, Uhura from Star Trek yeah. bust. And he showed the step-by-step -step for it. And it, 
he has a very specific plan on how to paint uh, something. And I, I want to know that plan because I don't mm. think that I'm incredibly comfortable painting large scale figures mm. just yet. I've painted maybe like three or four. Um, and it'd be cool to get like an expert's opinion on uh, his approach to it. Yeah. The, I, I'm dry, finding myself being drawn more and more to the reasoning behind that style, that very stark, almost F smoothness style mm -hmm. where you really are building in the, the lighting and the atmosphere in blocking in colors mm -hmm. and worrying about the, the smoothness and the, the final product later. But if you, if you don't get it set up with the correct ratio in your contrast at the beginning, it's something <laughs> smack the microphone with your hat. Um, if you don't do it at the beginning, it's so much harder to try to figure that out later, dude. Yes. Um, there's like, I had a video where I figured that out with, with shoulder pads. I was mm -hmm. like, this one took me 24 hours to do. And the second one took me eight minutes to do. How did I get three times faster? It's because you, you figured out beforehand how much of each color needs to be on the thing before you're like ready to start blending. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's such a huge thing that I think a lot of people don't, that, 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 that they underestimate. Um, but yeah, that's a big thing. Okay. So I, I think Angel Geraldo's would be a great one. And he's a great example of somebody that is not an English speaker. And that makes me really interested about like, he obviously has the amount of hours painted in his life is he's a full time mm -hmm. commissioned box art painter for a long time for a long time yeah um just to pick his brain where with no language barrier to really understand all that wealth of of knowledge and in, in history right um that would be really cool mm -hmm. so he'd be a great one yeah and then someone that i have to mention i don't have to but i would want to is roman lapot oh super God. unique way to painting and I want some of that in my life. Yeah. And I would ask him to keep saying Liam Neeson quotes through the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also he's another kind of like, uh, uh, Alfonso Geraldes person who is like, he's been teaching for so freaking long. Yeah. And so he has the process figured out. And, and even I'm familiar with it. Like all of his one-on-ones start with the same thing. It's like, you're, you're painting a wolf on a poster card. Uh, I don't know why he starts with that, but I assume he'd figure it out in the course of the class. And then from there, then you move into something else. Um, but just to pick his brain about his approach to painting would be so cool. And we should also fly to Germany and do that. Yes. And get, have, him, have him on the podcast. Yes. I'm going to motherland. take the show on the road, dude. The motherland? Yeah. Isn't that Russia? Well, no, I'm German, so that's my motherland. Oh, okay. Yeah. All I've right. never been. And I must go. Okay. <laughs> I must go. I must do it. <laughs> um... Yeah. Also, the thing with Roman that I, I think is a, another great aspect with that is he is a um, a trained teacher. Like yes. He went to school to be a teacher. Yeah. So there's a whole history of not only having taught many painting classes for years and years and years, but to, to take from a formal education and understanding what works in a traditional art teaching stance and to apply it to us, um, I feel like I'm set up probably to have more takeaways from from that. Yeah, I kind of wish that instead of being a software engineer, I was a teacher in my previous life because that would help me so much right now. Whereas being a programmer has helped me a little bit. Yeah, it's helped you with Discord. That's true. Yeah, I got wrote my own bot. I'm, I'm scared of Discord. Why are you scared of it? I don't want to start at Discord because I won't know what to do with it. <laughs> I'll create three channels and say, good luck, guys. Yeah. Discord's a little bit of a, its own can of worms. Yeah. We'll figure it out. I don't though. want to talk about that right now. Let's no, talk about it. No, no, no. Let's get back to Ben comments. <laughs> I was thinking about this. I was like, what's the best country for miniature painting? What do you yeah. mean? Uh, you know, I don't really know what I mean. Maybe I, maybe I mean if you had to move somewhere, where would you move? Maybe I mean if you could dissolve every single miniature painter into a liquid, uh, what would be the tastiest liquid? <laughs> maybe I mean which country has the most skill? Uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't thought it out fully. Um, let's start with where would you... New Zealand. Why? Because you don't know a single painter from New Zealand. I know Miss Castrain. 
Oh God. <laughs> he's Australian. Well, isn't he from New Zealand? Yeah, no, he's from Adelaide. Jeez. Well, we'll convince him to move to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Trent. Trent. Probably the biggest insult for an Australian to be misinterpreted as a New Zealander a Kiwi? And, and vice versa. Yeah. Neither of them like that. Really? Why? That's racist. I mean, they hate each are you, other. Are you racist, Trent? Yeah, Trent, are you racist? <laughs> nice. Nice way to diffuse that. <laughs> Just flip yeah, the table. Yeah, yeah, he was angry, but now he's like, wait, am I racist? <laughs> um, okay. It's one of the most beautiful places in the entire world. A. B. Lord of the Rings was shot there. Stop. C. I'm not asking where do you want to move in oh. general. Well, dude, you can paint miniatures anywhere. <laughs> Okay. If the only factor was I'm going to move somewhere such that I can be in the shit of miniature painting, the most classes, the coolest experiences, where would you live? Where would you move? This includes cons. This includes whatever else. Wherever Monte San Savino is. Okay. Know. Italy. Yeah. Italy. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking Germany. Yeah. Is there a lot of, you got Ben, you got Roman, you got yeah. Rafael Pica. Uh, yeah. If he ever paints again. He's painting lately. Mm, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are more, I'm sure. <laughs> I just can't think oh, of that. Also more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess there's quite a few in Spain as well. I mean, Spain is probably Spain's the European, probably, yeah. European hotbed. Yeah. Um, I think UK is a is an obvious contender because yeah. uh, you have Warhammer World, you have SMC, you have all the British painters like David Soper and Darren Latham and, uh, and Gareth Nicholas. And there's so many more, um, and mm -hmm. lots of, lots of fun events there as well. Yeah. Did you say Trent Dennison too? Trent, he's Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Bruh, what is wrong? I thought he was from England. See, I'm a real fan boy. This guy is a poser. <laughs> Dude, I just, my brain doesn't hear um, accent. Yeah, you've watched a video with Trent narrating it. It's, I've watched a lot of his videos. <laughs> you think he's British? Oh, well, I just. Dude, we've had this conversation. I don't have any. Guys. Dude, my brain is colorblind. I, oh, that's I'm, what it is. I am no. I, I see everyone as a human being, not as putting them in little boxes okay. about where they're from. Sometimes it's good to appreciate the differences in cultures and not just whitewash everything. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right back on you, bud. Hey, let's go get some Taco Bell for lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the cultural appropriation at its finest and tastiest. Mm, yeah. Give me that crunch wrap. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you're right. He is. He is Australian. <laughs> In in like if I listen to his voice, I'll know that he's Australian. Just in my head right now, for some reason, I thought he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Anyway, also America, because yeah. the thing that we need to realize with America is there is equally as many amazing painters over here. Our country is just so stinking huge from a landmass perspective that we feel so separated. Yeah. Yeah, like the you know, United Kingdom is like smaller than New York State. Yeah, yeah. The all of Western Europe could fit into Texas. Yeah, and like what? There's like it was sixty, fifty million in UK, and there's some three hundred and thirty million in the United States. Mm -hmm. On paper, America should have a lot of very good miniature painters, but we're starting to slip into a conversation that I want to have at some point, and I think we've had it at one point, which is why is America bad at miniature painting? Sure. Because there, obviously, there are good. I think we had this conversation. We might have, yeah. There, obviously, there are good painters in in America, but the per capita or whatever you want to say is totally off. Um, sure, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, you, you're you're looking at. I mean, you're looking at total population as a whole. You're not looking at. Um, total population of in comparison to the the hobby and interest in, in general itself just because something's not more popular here doesn't mean that there's less people overall it just means that there's a lower percentage it's just like oh there's better soccer players in all of europe than there are in all of america and why why is that because there's way more people here mm -hmm. well it's it's not it's not just comparing numbers of people to determine quality of a, of a given thing so there's a lot of other factors that go in the claim you're making is that the percentage of people in America that are hobbyists yeah. is lower than the percentage in the UK. Yes, 
Absolutely. So it's like 5% here and it's like 8% there. Yeah. Okay. Because if we we're just talking about strict number of people, China would beat us at everything. Yeah. And yeah, there's a reason they don't because <laughs> it's a multivariable equation. Right. Okay. That's fair. Okay. So I guess the way I was approaching this topic in general was to try to determine what I would most want to get out of a one-on-one -on -one experience. Yes. Because that's what we're, that's what at the core of this question is, is in one day or two days or whatever you want to time limit you want to put on it, what would be the most valuable to you? And so I think how we flip this back on the sprues and spruettes is to say, if it was you and there was some, somebody that you would be able to spend a day with or two days, what would you most want to get out of that? What would you most really hope to be able to leave with that you didn't come with? And that's a great set of questions to ask yourself, whether it's going into a weekend class with Scotty boy and I, once the Rona is gone and we're hitting the road and, and you want to join us for a class, or it's somebody locally that's been painting for a while and they agree to come over to your house. I think by you going through that process of what do I really want to get out of it? What would be most valuable to me? What are the questions I want to ask? I think you need to go through that with yourself prior to the, then the actual event. Just simply going into something with you is like, I'm just going to keep an open mind and I'm going to let it be what it's going to be. I don't think you have as much chance to really get as much value out of that time as you could. If you didn't do some proactive thinking and maybe even jot stuff down, it's like, oh, I don't want to forget that I talk about this or ask this question mm -hmm. or show how I'm doing this and why it's frustrating me. Right. I'm trying to glaze this power sword and I can't get it to like have a smooth, bright, you know, shiny white at the top and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. The more you really decide what you want, the more you can be direct. Because most great painters, great mini painting teachers, that kind of stuff. They have the ability to adapt and to help you with what you need. And if you just are passive and sit back and let them lead, they'll go into their autopilot mode. And this isn't a knock on them. They'll go into what they've done before. Right. And maybe what they've done before will still be helpful. You want right. them to still lead. They are the teacher. Right. But they'll just keep doing that if you don't stop them and say, okay, let's do this. Let me ask you on this. Show me this. That kind of thing. That's a good point. I thought of someone else. Um, I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, I mean, this is people that we talked about before on the podcast, uh, Darren Latham, because he seems to get this impossible level of cleanliness that I refuse to believe is attributed to Photoshop editing that everyone in my comment section seems to always say whenever I do an heavy metal Marines episode, they're like, there's a reason it looks better. It's because it's edited. Like maybe there's like contrast added, you know, like with some of those like sliders, but I refuse to believe someone goes into the photo and removes like bumps and dust particles. So it's yeah. all flat and smooth. I feel like there's some consideration that he's taking that's making his model appear so fucking pristine. Yeah. And I want to figure out what that is. Also David Soper, cause he's in England or he, yeah, he's, he's in the United Kingdom, but he, Australia, no, no, he's, he's British <laughs> for sure. Uh, but he also, Paints in a style totally not like anyone else in 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 British in British in British in Britain. Why are there so many fucking names for the same goddamn island? <laughs> yeah. No, there isn't. There isn't. United Kingdom is a combination of Northern Ireland, Wales, England, and Scotland. No, not Northern Ireland. The other part. Northern Ireland is its own country. Okay. Anyways, um, yeah, those two guys, big time. And Trent Tennyson, as long as you're there. Yeah, might as well hit him up, too. <laughs> um, All right. That's it. Goodbye. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so else? we tied. You know, I was a little bit hesitant on this topic in general because it, it made it, it's going to make it sound like there is a, a top tier of people that would be considered best mini painting teachers. Because if we're, we're talking about a one on one with one person, we're talking about wanting to learn the most, meaning they're the best teacher. That's not true. There are people that have been doing it for a long time and people that are amazing painters that are also teach at conventions, teach one-on-ones, teach classes and stuff. And that doesn't mean that they're the only good ones. It doesn't mean that they would even be the best one for you. For sure. We're yeah. just, we're, we're throwing out some stuff that, that we know, but we could sit here for another two hours and come up with another 25 names each that would all be legit, great, great answers to this question. Yeah. You know, um, 
there's another episode we did that's related tangentially and it's uh what makes for a good class sure and that will we'll have that linked below but that'll help you decide for yourself uh what a good teacher is going to be for you for me and for john it's different things um but that'll help you kind of discover your value stream for like what makes a good teacher. And then you'll have your own list of people that you want to meet and chat with. Dude, I just, I just thought too, was like, I was thinking like, Oh, well, other Americans, Jen Haley, man. Oh yeah. She can create the most subtly smooth, beautiful, tiny, teeny, tiny 28 mil <laughs> models that look Amazing. And most of the folks we're talking about here, not most, but a large percentage of them, they're working on larger scale models. Yeah. What she can can produce on the tiniest scale is ridiculous. And I would like to see how the hell she does that and to show my big ape fingers try to do that. <laughs> does Jen Haley have somewhere where she shares her stuff? I don't know. Okay. Because I'm friends with her on Facebook and she doesn't do it there. No. I don't know if she has like an Instagram or something like that. I don't, I think she does the, where I've seen her post most stuff that I've seen is through the kingdom death groups. Oh, like recently in the last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you're more up to date than I am. Okay. That's good. I don't know if she has an Instagram. Okay. I would hope so. Come on, Jen. Come on, Jen. Jen. Get yourself out there. Come on. You you need a craftsman. (laughs) Uh, No one's going to get the craftsman jokes. I think they're funny. You tolerate them. What do you mean? I love them. Okay. Well, I love him. I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> Go check out the Craftsman YouTube channel. Okay. <laughs> and then you'll get my jokes out. The Craftsman. Okay. Your jokes are, you are just sounding like him. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the extent of the comedy. That, that's the extent of most of my comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Interpreting. Okay. Shitty versions of... People you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word. Impersonation, right? Okay. That's okay. the word. People right. you know talk a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that's it for that topic. Um, these conversations don't need to be three hours long. <laughs> As we're so <laughs> They don't at. need to, but they usually are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sinopol, for the uh, for the topic. If you want to suggest topics for our Patreon, consider becoming a patron. For our podcast, consider becoming a Patreon. Lots of P words. They're hard to do. Out of the news, Black Dahlia Murder released a new album. I didn't know this until someone asked me if I heard the new album, and I discovered that I had not. Uh, and I listened to it. And in looking for a record to buy or a CD, man, remember CDs? Remember those things? You got CDs, right? Dude, I sold most of them at grad sale. Oh. I still have, oh, I have a couple of like big thing, big CD cases that you used to keep in your car back in the day. Yeah, and you yeah, had CD yeah. players. Yeah, we'd, yeah, yeah. we'd have CD players in our vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you had the big fat binder of CDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I that was it. that was the number one thing why people would break into cars. Would smash your window and grab your CD binder. For CDs. I still got them. I still have a CD binder. And my wife has one of those things that you put into the the the, the, oh, the visor. visor. Yeah, yeah, baby. One there too. I like CDs because uh, like when you're road tripping, dude, your internet. Yeah, dude. You you lose it, okay? Yeah. CDs don't need no fucking internet. You no. just play them. Yeah, it's anyway. f- and there's nothing better than riding shotgun and digging through somebody's CD binder. Yeah, be like, oh, some ICP in here. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, yeah. So Black Dahlia Murder new album came out, and they also released a D and D. This is a hard word for me to say. Supplement with their album. So. They have a story for you to follow along and we'll role see, play. Ridiculous the new album's called Invenomous. No, it's just called Verminous. The album is called Verminous. But yeah, the, the book is sick looking. It comes with its own dice that match the uh, album art cover. Um, but it's cool. I like it a lot. It's 24 pages. Okay, so, oh, dude, you can get their own dice. Mm-hmm. With the CD. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Look at all the sweet merch bumps they're getting here. Mm-hmm. RPG bum- bundle. Mm-hmm. Uh, Five blank m- character sheets. Wow. Maps. Four creature encounter cards. It says it's D&D 5e. Okay. So, obviously, this is going to be a rat-based campaign. That, that too. It's, uh, it's, it's like almost scaven-y. Dude. It would be great. Okay. Here would be the best part about this. 
is if in this, if it's a short series of adventures or a small campaign or whatever, if they had cues in this aspects or different portions of the game where it would cue to you play one of their songs from the album, that would be background music or be like an introduction to a bad guy coming in here in mm-hmm. these deep, dank sewers. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> 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 those are the mice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. That kind of reminds me of a guy from Midwinter Minis. He has like an album uh, that is used, it's supposed to be used when you're playing 40K. Um, mm. But the tricky part is there's a difference between background music and f- most music, which is foreground music. <laughs> I don't know, right. that's not a term people use. <laughs> um, yeah. For me, metal is, that's the main event. I can't listen to metal and do something else. I'm listening to metal. I am digging up corpses or I am murdering someone or I'm headbanging. One of those three things. I'm not, paint, I don't paint minis to metal. That's just, that's just, I don't like that. Yeah. That just seems like a different kind of uh, level of energy. Yeah. Yeah. So what we learned from this small bit of the podcast episode <laughs> is if you're walking down the street and you see Scott and he's listening to metal, run because <laughs> he's there to do some murder hey, you're gonna die <laughs> you're gonna die boy <laughs> hey run um all right new spira mirabilis sculpt yeah that happened quick didn't it uh maybe yeah. not it was been at least a month I know. Well, because they tried doesn't he usually put out like three or four a year so I guess that would make sense from when he announced the dwarven miner yeah not to be mistaken for a minor dwarf <laughs> um he's not underage no he's not underage he's, he's, a, he's, he's under he, the ground is he, is he an underage minor yeah he's that's a dwarven that's minor a, minor that's a funny sculpt right there <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that was probably three months ago or about now so that would make sense so this new one uh, which september 4th will be when the pre-sale goes out for that. And it's only 48 hours. So I don't know how to math to know if it's still open right now, if when this podcast episode not, goes live. Shoot. It'll end on the 6th. The day and before. This goes live on the So 7th. when you hear this, if you didn't get it, it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, it's a squig rider. It's a, it's a goblin and a squig. He's riding on a squig. And there's like another like little baby goblin or something over his shoulder. Oh, I didn't one goblin. that one. Yeah, but the the squig is so circular. It's, it's hilarious. Yeah, it's such an orb. It's yeah. It's it, a beach ball. His face eyes. is like on the surface of his body, and, he's, <laughs> and he doesn't have like a head. You know, it's like his body is the head. It just has the derpiest funny look. I I'm getting this because I want to paint that thing as funny as possible. <laughs> if you get it, it makes me feel like I need to get it. Yeah, I want to paint it with the squig. Having as close to like human skin tone as possible because I would be so uncomfortable to yeah. look at. It's making me feel uncomfortable right now. Just thinking about it. <laughs> Jeez. Oh man. It's like, ooh, yuck! Is that thing, is that thing made of human skin? Yeah. yeah. And then the goblin could just be like this m- muddy olive brownie green. A big contrast there. I like it. Are you gonna get it? Probably not. He's like holding the fat folds to hold on to the squig too. Oh, He's like hands are dug into the orb. Like it just it, the thing feels like it's made out of like jello. <laughs> oh man. The more you describe it, the more I want it. Yeah, dude. But you I did. feel like I need to paint the other one I have. I don't did even you get have, it yet? And I don't have it yet. Uh hopefully soon. I think I got the tracking for it. Um yeah. but we'll see. Oh man, that's surprising. Well, I mean I backed mine. Maybe he ships them out in order of backers. Yeah, I think he, he does it in stages. Mm-hmm. He doesn't, like, make all the casts at once and then ship them all at the same time. He might do them in, like, chunks of 50 or 100. I don't know. Yeah, because I was, like, I backed it in the first, like, 15 minutes that it was live. So I was thinking maybe that's why I... Oh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, He yeah. just have a literal list in the order of backers. and he's Probably. Down there. That makes sense. So that's Friday. So we're going to be at your house. Oh, when it's live? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're trying to figure that out. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna all sit there together and order it. I bet I can convince both of them to get it too. No, you don't think so? I think Sam would do it for sure. You think? I think Sam's the one who's his own. He's his own independent person. He'll do whatever he wants. I know, but I'll like 
make sly comments that will make him think it's his own idea. Oh, you're gonna, not overtly say it. You're gonna you're gonna get in his brain. Yeah. Okay. Literally. I look the forward fork. to. <laughs> Jeez. Just poke around in there. I look forward to you trying. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's cool. All right. So I want to talk really here on the quick on the newsy news because recently we've had another Games Workshop Twitch stream for announcements. And they happen on Saturday mornings here in the U.S. I would assume it's like early evening or something in the U.K. I don't math, so whatever. <laughs> I don't math. <laughs> if I do too much math, I have to go to hospital. <laughs> um, and so it's their Twitch thing. And they keep growing in the amount of people that watch that. Like, I don't even know. I'm not going to guess. But I'm thinking it's in tens of thousands. No. The people that watch it in the live stream. No. It's every time the one I've seen, I remember they grow and more and more people. And so my thought is... I'm going to guess under 10,000. You think so? For sure. Okay. Well, dude, live numbers are weird. Weird? Yeah. They're, They're weird. Are they a different kind of maths? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like getting 100,000 views on a video. Oh, yeah. His it's time like, is inconsequential. I think the equivalent of that in the live stream version is getting 1,000 con- concurrent viewers. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. So to, if they had tens of thousands of viewers, that'd be crazy to me. Think about that, though. It's, it, it's in a, a time of not being able to play the game. I get it. I get it. On a Saturday, and they're announcing all the goodies for every single game. Yeah, it's enticing. Mm-hmm. So I got a couple things to say about this. Okay. One, when they first started doing this because they weren't – going to do the be able to do the announcements at adepticon that's just how this all came to pass right all the gw announcements that, that were there for adepticon and then for shoot there's going to be another one that they do announcements at was it gen con yeah New gen con lvo they, gen they con, do announcements okay. at all of them and then at nova there was going to be one i think that's what the one this week was supposed to be like the nova replacement okay. from the previous one we're seeing these more and more when it first started because of coronavirus the production quality is pretty low and I'm not upset with that. Nobody was. We're just trying to make it work. Everyone's streaming from home and we're just the yeah. different people that they're bringing on and chatting and showing pictures and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I started thinking about it in comparison to like video game shows where they announce the big trailers for the new games that are coming out mm-hmm. or Sony or Microsoft announces their new system or Nintendo high and mighty won't do anything unless it's at their own Nintendo convention. Or oh, right. Okay. So... And I started thinking about how those are such an industry standard and hype builder and marketing giant for the industry. And seeing how Games Workshop has continued this, the question I asked myself is, are they going to continue this? Even if, even when the land of conventions and having those shows from the conventions come into play. Are they going to use this as a way to understand the piggybacking of live stream at the convention hall, like a video game expo? Mm -hmm. Is that the next stage? I think it should be. I think that that's the next direction for them to continue to build and give all these people on board live. The production needs to go up about three levels because it's still for a company that is worth as many billions as they are worth, it boggles my mind how little they put into displaying to the public the awesomeness of their product. And I think you, if, if a Naughty Dog Studios can put me on my ass by watching this amazing trailer and having this live at VGA Expo, what it's like to live in the world of Cyberpunk 2077, if they can do that, they're one tiny freaking studio worth $10, 15000000 million compared to this organization. You guys are dropping the ball. Oh, yeah. You're relating this to like like E3 and stuff like that yeah. where like they have like a... Okay, sure. Yeah. Right. It needs to be like... Yeah. like Or like Doom, like when id released Doom, it was like they had like a freaking metal concert and stuff like that. Yes. That's like a... You know, I don't know if we can really blame... GW a lot for that because that's not the current culture of live shows yet. But it'd, those obviously are it'd be all, cool if it got there. I have a, I have a friend that the he, he takes off the work week 
of from work for E3 yeah. and watches the live streams all day, every day of every announcement from every company. And those, wow. the amount of people that do that, I didn't know this was a thing. They not only go there in person, but the income that they bring from the constant live stream from that week, week and how many concurrent viewers they have is pretty insane. Yeah. We're so far away from that. I, I think we're, we're away from it in terms of the, sh the sheer amount of people that are interested in the media, medium. But I don't think we're that far away. And there's already the standard set across other hobby-related, nerd-related culture, comic book-related, video game-related, toy-related, that's already doing this. Yeah. That me watching a dude in Nottingham with his bookshelf behind him, and then he hits the button, and then there's a picture of a giant cow with a hammer. I feel like there's more there. And I feel like that this, I hope this is the right trend of them going towards announcements in a more open to the world way. Yeah. Instead of just, oh, hey, we had it at Adepticon and, and in two hours, because everybody here took the pictures and they're gonna share it on social media anyway, in two hours, Warhammer community page will show, show what was shared here. Make it a spectacle. Make it something that is a draw and it's a FOMO missing out, fear of missing out on this. And you build more buzz. You build people that were just, oh, I'd heard about Warhammer or whatever. Maybe this is their, their connection to really taking the plunge. Yeah. You, you build a positive mass hysteria. I like it. I like it. And I love the idea of it. Um, the production around, sh first of all, we can't really compare E3 to uh, GW some guy, you know, doing a live stream from his house, right? Because E3 happened when there wasn't the coronavirus, right? Yeah. You're talking about you're talking about in a post coronavirus world, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. The kind of like rigging and equipment you need to get that kind of live production, it's like you have multiple like live production cameras, which are different than like the ones we shoot on. They cost I saw tens I, of thousands of dollars. Like you, you saw that video. Yeah, yeah. Why do cameras cost this much? Yeah. 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 Super cool. So basically, like that guy. Um, like 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 three or four of those, a whole like live streaming deck with like several employees. It's like a really big production. Something I'd love to freaking do. <laughs> um, to be an ENG camera operator, that'd be awesome. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's like a decade away. I mean, I hope it's not, but I feel like it is. Cause like we're not we're not even live streaming keynotes at conventions now in any capacity. There isn't even some nerd with a camera on a tripod who's got hooked into the mixer and got the audio. Like we're not, we're not even there yet. I think I, th my first, um, I was just quickly Googling how much they're worth. They're worth, they're worth over a billion British pounds. So oh, GW. Yeah. You okay. telling, you telling me that a $10,000 camera is an issue. Yeah. It's yeah. ridiculous. So here <laughs> for a billion dollar in company, it's not, it's not a matter of, I have the money, so I'm willing to spend it. The, the everything in a business is a transaction, right? Sure. So if I spend a hundred thousand dollars on a live production event of my keynote at Adepticon, how much value is that going to add to my business? And so I feel like GW is probably a stingier company when it comes to stuff like that. They, they are, they are extremely, archaic in terms of their marketing approach right correct? yeah like they the, I, the concept of giving youtubers money to have a call to action to buy their product in a video is foreign to them and they're not interested in it i, f I feel like they'd have a hard time spending it's, that kind of cash it's it's not even that they're they're probably like obtuse to it and don't it, it's that it's they, not foreign right, 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 right. That was they, my word. yeah but i get what you're saying they understand that is an option they yeah. can, i'm sure they have seen that other folks in the hobby do such a thing they have actually chosen to go a different route. So when we have our well, our convention, mm -hmm. we'll hire a live streaming panel and they'll stream all of the keynote speeches and mm -hmm. it'll be amazing. That was the thing I was gonna say. And I thought about it in the moment. First Adapticon I went to, we went together three years ago now, or two years, however many years, I don't even know what time is. Um, <laughs> that was, it shocked me when I, we got there and I realized there was no overall agenda. There wasn't like, I mean, yes, they had the little pamphlet thing or whatever, but there wasn't, I've been to so many conventions and um, all the kind of crap for works stuff before. Um, and it's always well, 
there's always like a, a central hub of organization, right? There's at least the keynote kickoff, the welcome, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a, there is a, a, a bunch of live sessions for just seating and, and that kind of stuff. And at Adepticon, it seems like they're not alone here, that there's never coming together for a big panel review or a big uh, announcement or anything never does anybody we get maybe it's just because we couldn't physically put them all in one space to begin with so maybe it's just a logistical nightmare to ask of that sure but i was just surprised how different it was it is just more like going to the freaking county fair <laughs> you know that's you what the, walk yeah, around. that's a great analogy that's exactly <laughs> what it is yeah. yeah there is no main track of events to follow Interesting. You gave I, him I couldn't find the the birthing barn. <laughs> that, <laughs> the dairy barn and the live birth barn. I wanted a pet a baby chicken. <laughs> we did we did the drive through of the the state fair. I heard that you had to buy tickets right at that yeah, right away from yeah, that. Yeah. What was that like? It was okay. Did you just like eat your weight in fried food? Yeah, it was kind of fast. They car they're kinda of like ushering you through because obviously there's, there's like one hour blocks. And there's like a million cars. And so like once you got into the main thing, like I was driving. And so like I was like driving, roll my window down, giving cards out, eating a, eating a nugget over here. And then like <laughs> getting, the, getting the card back and then getting food and handing it to the passenger. So it was kind of a little hectic, but it was still cool. Okay. I want to take a moment. Take a moment. And share how utterly American that this experience was. A drive through stay yeah. fair. We have coronavirus, so we can't have a stay fair. So what we need to do as Americans is to bring all of the world's fattiest foods together and then we will buy tickets for the opportunity to buy that food without getting out of my car So Mary, and just oh, yeah. sit and smorgasbord our way through driving with the window down and just eating all that fat Dude, yeah. sugar. Yeah, it's I mean, so there's, American. A, there's a little bit more to it. Like, let me. I mean, like, summer is such a huge deal in Minnesota, and that's such a, yeah, that's, a, a, a that's a pinnacle of summer. Yeah, there's like companies rely on that income to like survive, kind of thing. But yeah, it is very American. I do sweet Martha's cookies. They Woo. work. They work ten days a year. Yeah, that's all they need. That's a million dollar company. Got a bucket. Got a bucket of that stuff. Did yeah, the, the friends in the car with us were like. You don't really like sweet Martha's. And we're like, what's, what's wrong with you? Get out. And so we bought the bucket <laughs> and they ate most of the damn cookies. Wow. Ironic. Bastards. Yeah. Ethan, if you're watching this, what I are see, you? I see you. What are you doing with your life? <laughs> Go get your famous Amos, you monster. <laughs> all right. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you for all sticking around and listening to us talk about all sorts of dumb things. We really appreciate it. John. If you didn't stick around, go to hell because you're not listening to this anyway, so you won't know. Exactly. They, they wouldn't uh, have heard that. Yeah. But you did stick around, so you can stay here. Go to with heaven. Us. Go to heaven. You can go with us. We'll also be going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will be. I don't know where Scott's going to be. It's a cooler journey there, though. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit warm. John, if they want to support the PCAST. You want to support the PCAST? Hey, you thought you said you hate the word PCAST. Yeah, but I like to lean into your jokes. Okay, because my jokes are funnier. Yeah. They're funnier? They're funnier. They're plural funnier. Well, I'm just going with maths. Maths and holiday, yeah. <laughs> On holiday, um, they can buy a t-shirt. <laughs> we have trapped under plastic shirts, which I am currently... Don't touch. I knew you were going to touch me as soon as I saw... Like, like, I have this force field, and as soon as <laughs> you're within six inches of my body, you can't stop. You're not a toucher, are you? Like, I'm a toucher, but not your fucking gangly fingers. <laughs> Get them away. They're all damp. What the fuck? <laughs> in your butt crack. <laughs> I'm a sweaty boy, dude. Oh, man. You can buy a t-shirt. That's one thing you can do. Yeah, we'll make sure to send you one that Scott didn't fondle with his fingers. <laughs> and uh, you can also support us on Patreon. We've got a Patreon account, which does help us keep these podcasts rolling, rolling, rolling. Sorry, I didn't mean to limp biscuit us right there. Yeah. Um, not, and not cool. uh, you get some cool stuff by uh, being a, a sprut and spruette and joining the Patreon account. Um, we have an extended version of the podcast where we call it the after party. We just get to hang with us for a bunch of extra segments where we show the, our favorite new miniatures the for the week that we've seen painted by somebody else. This is usually the part that Scott describes, so I'm going to let him describe the rest of it. 
Uh, you also uh, get to hear our feedback of one of the sprudes and spruettes in the community. So as a patron, you get to submit photos of your painted uh, art and we live critique it in an episode. And lastly, we talk about a new thing that we experimented with in this uh, previous week. So for me, it was OSL. For John, it was blood splattering. Now, Splatter! But there's a new thing every single week that we've tried and, and either failed or done well at, and we talk about it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, also, if you're a member of the Patreon, you can submit ideas for topics for the podcast. And oh, baby, did we get some this last week. Heck yeah, we did. We are bombarded. Big time. Um, what was his name? I want to give him props right now. Nathan? Sam Lowry. Sam Lowry. Gave us a ton of topics. He really gave us a year's worth of topics. He was like, here's a year's worth of topics. Just casual. Just dropped it. He just like dropped it. Boof. And like he's a gone. Golden brick. Other free ways to support the podcast are uh, watching this show with uh, ads on. You can whitelist uh, channels uh, for YouTube ads, depending on what ad blocker you use. I know you use it. I see you. I see it. I use it. Okay. I'm a fucking YouTuber. Okay. I see you. So yeah, I watch this channels that I care about want to give support to. You can also just tell your nerd friends about our podcast or uh, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. I like that. A smootherino. Thank you. Yeah. So we got more work ahead of us. I don't know if it's going to be today. I don't know if it's going to be another day. We mm-hmm. got work ahead of us to uh, really get down to the businessy things. You know, Nigel, he's going to have to come out and check the charts. That was a sick reference in the latest video. Dude, I'm glad that... See, it's all about the callback. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so... True fans. True fans would understand who Nigel is. That video has criminally low views (laughs) for how fucking great it is. Uh, Like, the true fans really know that skit. (laughs) It's probably the the mountain peak of your entire YouTube career. (laughs) It's close. It's up up there. Darren Latham saw it and thought it was pretty hilarious. Did he? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, dude. It's like, Darren, which one of these guys are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll link that video below, too. If you haven't seen our skit on Games Workshop <laughs> and how it's run, you're missing out. You are missing out. And you, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe or not. Okay, sorry. No, 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 no. no. Uh, so I can't get to the end of this without thinking that. Well, what do we say? I know what we say. What do we say? Thank you for hanging out for this one. And until next time, when we catch you on the flippity flop.